so for the cell shading thing, I think I'll probably do a few different examples of like lighting. I'm also gonna try and find a nice like matte, like easy to see base color to do. Yeah, that might work best. Because part of this demo is I'm gonna show cell shading as it is like when you're trying to do a piece and how to think of the structure of shadow and light. So here's what I'm gonna set tell you guys. When you're doing cell shading, you want to think of the object that you're shading in terms of three dimension. Importantly too, you also want to uh, figure out where your light source is coming from. Since the light source is coming from this side, it's important to think of our character and our shape as like a three dimensional object, obviously. Honestly, before you even put any of the colors down, you should probably put your shadows down first and they don't have to be the color of the shadows that you're actually planning to use. Literally do it with whatever is easiest for you to shape. Also, I think a good way to like introduce this is the reason that it's called cell shading is because you are literally drawing color cells like the things that used to go on top of anime and other animated cartoons on like glass panes but since we're not doing it in color cells we're doing it digitally but you can still think of these as just like the blocks of color that make up a thing that make up an object and in this instance the blocks of color that we're doing are the shadows because that's what the focus or the subject of this is for the first round of cell shading like what we're focusing on this time we are just focusing on the shadows and placing them everywhere light isn't hitting so because the lighting is coming from kind of up here like to this top left area we want to make sure that we're getting the nice rounding shape what we're doing and what these little lines are it's going to be more evident when i like fill the spaces in obviously is everywhere the light is not i'm basically drawing an outline of where our shadow is going to be because then we can fill it in and then it's way easier than going and like coloring it by hand the other thing is there's no hard like science to how you shape your shadows typically when it comes to curved forms like a rounded brush tail or like the ears which are kind of cone shaped almost with like a beveled rounded bottom you want the line of your shadow to be round because that's like a way for you to portray the form of the object without just drawing the outline but you can help portray like depths of these objects with the lines of the cell shading because where your shadows end up is very indicated by the forms themselves. And honestly, because the light's coming from behind the critter, this really would all be shadowed. So when you have your light source, right? Or when you have your shadows cell shaded in, what this is, is all of the area that the light is not. That's what you want to think of your shadows as. In contrast to that, your level two cell shading or the secondary light source is going to be everywhere light either bounces off another surface, which is usually opposite of where your light source is. Because if you think about it, if light's coming down from this direction, all of this ground surface area is going to be bouncing light up at the character, especially if it's like a hardwood floor or water is in front of the character. All of these create different kinds of secondary light. But let's just say Critter is sitting outside with some leaves and they're nice like orange wet leaves. Those are going to reflect some light. It's not going to be super harsh, but it is going to be there. So what that is going to be shown in is this secondary light source, which is usually coming up from the ground. It's going to be a little bit desaturated compared to the light source coming from up top, but it's still going to be a little brighter than the the shadow area. You can also do secondary light sources that aren't bounce light from the ground, but this is just like the easiest, like if you want to have another light source to kind of fill out your figure, if you have like a really big region of shadow, like let's say they're standing up against like a wall and it's a plaster wall because concrete absorbs light pretty solidly because of the texture of it. But let's say it's like a plaster wall, like there's some shine to it that would bounce light onto the character too. The color and texture of the surface matters a lot on how bounce light will look. Yes, and it also matter what kinds of light is being bounced. And by that I mean like, let's say you have a red surface, but you're outside in a very like white or blue lighting. The color that's gonna bounce onto your character is still gonna be red because that's what isn't being absorbed by the surface of that object. So the trouble of course comes in when it comes to like bounce lighting is thinking to the how do you like show that light is coming up from beneath something and usually that's like you do that through shape and some of the shapes you can get from it are very funky so they'll be fun 
but they can also get kind of they can get kind of weird and you want to make sure that they're still creating like appealing shapes i'm still confused on how to use light on shadows like the light that comes from bright stuff so bounce light let's say i have critter and critter is standing in a big open field and this field is full of grass you have to remember all objects in every world fictional or non-fictional they have texture and they have surface and the surface that they have has a level of reflectiveness because the reflectiveness is like determining how much light is the object absorbing and how much is it reflecting and pushing away. So think if something very matte or like very soft like a t-shirt. T-shirts do bounce light but they would not bounce nearly as much light as say something that's like a plastic children's toy because the plastic surface of that toy bounces more light. But, but, and this is a huge thing, like a addendum. The color of the object also determines whether or not it's going to bounce light. Black does not bounce light. You will never see a black surface get hit by something and reflect black at you because it just doesn't do that. I don't know why. So there is the sun above Critter. Then we have our sky. This is a hideous color of cyan. Our light source is coming from above. It's shining directly on top of them. They're fully illuminated by white light. These colors that you're using to color them are probably going to be closest to their base color palette. Like if you stuck them in a white room. If it's a really, really harsh light, then you might take those colors and crank them a little towards like white, like almost blow them out, make them desaturated. Or you could take them towards yellow. That will also work to create kind of like a golden sunny atmosphere. But typically sunlighting, like just normal day sunlighting, is gonna look pretty similar to like a white box room. So first and foremost, this circle of shadow is coming from Critter's fat head. And I'm actually gonna like do the bottom of its head in shadow too. A sphere will never have any area like completely in light yes, if it's getting top down light. And then I'll also shadow the bottom of its body because the bottom of its body kind of like rounds down. And then we could do some little bits under the arms. So here's how bounce light works. You have the sun coming from above. You have this grass underneath Critter that's getting hit by the light as well. The other thing is you'll have the shadow that comes underneath Critter that's the shadow it's casting on the grass, which for those that want to draw, shadows are usually not black. They are usually a more saturated version of the color, typically saturated than the direction of the environment. In this instance, we're outside. So the environment is very blue and it's very like white yellow because of the sun. And because those two colors together make green, you're gonna get a darker green shadow. To get the light that's reflecting off of the grass up onto the critter. You have to think of it as all of the light is shooting up from the grass towards the critter because the sun is coming down onto it. So wherever the light is coming from, the bounce light comes up in the direction towards it. We have horror tagged for the stream. Help. I didn't realize. Hold on, let me fix that. Sorry, it's because we were playing a horror game last week. Although tagging this as horror is kind of hilarious, I can't lie. The shadow color is what I'm personally struggling with in my own art. Would you mind going over that more slowly in a minute? The shadow color is honestly, that might be an entirely different stream, I'll be so frank, because that is color theory. That is not, this is just about the shape of the shadow and where you put light and shadow, but color and like shading colors is color theory, unfortunately. So as I was saying though, oh wow, I actually just picked like a perfect color for it. So think of the light coming up from the grass. It's gonna hit the critter on all of these parts underneath its form that are facing the grass. So that's all of the regions that are lowest and closest to the grass, but also the underside of its chin or like under its arms. By doing this, you give it a little more figure. So you can say, okay, this is where light is hitting from the source light. This is where the character falls into shadow. And then this is the trim of the area that has fallen into shadow and is closest to where light is bouncing from something else. So some other examples of like things that would create bounce light. Let's say Critter is standing against a bright featureless white wall. The other way that you can denote really harsh sunlight is by taking your shading color, your shadow color, and actually moving it towards blue. I can't exactly tell you why this works. You will want to have kind of like an outline around it that's like warm. I think that has to do with the way that skin absorbs light because 
your body would never just have a fully blue shadow. Uh, that means that you'd probably be dead. Blue shadows, for whatever reason, help connotate like a kind of harsh sunlight time of day. Probably because the blue is borrowing from the atmosphere, like the sky around it. The other thing is it won't be everywhere. I'm not fully sure why it's some places but not others. The reason that I did this was to show you the bounce light from this wall. Because this is a large surface area that's reflecting light because it's also getting hit by the sunlight, right? And the character is standing right up close to it. So what you would do is you would take the shadow color, so this blue, you're gonna move the color dial, so take this blue, and move it closer to like that yellow kind of sunshine color, and then take the hue, the saturation of the color, and move it towards white. But make sure you keep a little bit of gray in there because it's not gonna be a perfectly bright light because it is a reflection. But this might take some toggling to get a color that you like because I think this is where I wanna be with it. This light here that you're drawing, this is the reflection of the wall and the light that is coming from the wall that's being reflected. So it's just gonna hit the sides of the character that are facing the light. There are some places that you can add an additional thing, like additional highlights. And so I guess this would kind of be, I'm gonna make this darker just so it's easier to see, level three. And I don't always include level 3 because sometimes there's just not a lot of places that you need it. But this is your highlights. And what I mean by that is there any points of really, really harsh light on your character? I don't use a lot of highlights because technically I think that this like white or like lighter area constitutes as a highlight for me. But there are still going to be some regions that get like a little more light just because of whatever material they're made out of or like where they are in relation to the light source. For example, the tails of this character are always covered in like ink or paint. So there would be a like kind of harsher light source here because this is a wet texture. Like this is a wet area of the character. And as gross as that sounds, it's like a good way to show that the texture of the surfaces is a little different. The other place that you're gonna get a highlight is in the eye here because eyes are wet, unfortunately. Thinking about that is a little gross, but it is a good way to show that this eye texture is different than like the fur texture, say. It'll mess up the values if you keep doing rings of highlight shadow. Exactly, it starts to get kind of like muddy looking. I don't really know what the right word is. So sometimes you really only need these three segments. The level three is just kind of like the last minute little touches that you can add. The other place that you can add them to and where I like to put them, I like making my paws look kind of jelly. The next part of this process, right, is taking all of that layered work that we did and then bringing it over to Critter when they're colored. You're gonna wanna pick your darkest shadow color first. And my reason for suggesting that is because it helps you know what the darkest point of your drawing is. And by this point in the drawing, if you want to color the line art, you can also pick your line art color because there should be nothing that gets darker than this in terms of like the shaded region. What's kind of helpful about this, if you did your due diligence in this layer, you can just kind of like do that. <laughs> and select the regions you want to color with your new shadow color. Maybe we do the rim light first because then we can figure out what color is in between. And I'm going to have it be like really nice and gold, I think, because if the leaves beneath Critter are like this kind of gold color, then of course the light reflected from them would also be this kind of yellow gold. Yeah, there we go. Or, well, because the other color is going to be kind of like this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We might need to do these two at the same time. Because if this is the color of the fill light, then this might even need to be whiter. Ooh, but now it's getting ugly. <laughs> this is the only trouble with the fill light is that like sometimes it's just too much. Okay, maybe this is the move. This second fill layer. I think this looks good as it is. My mouth just made a horrible noise. And if it were to get, if there were to be any more rings of color added, it just would be too much. When it comes to my shading, I color the line art in certain places. Sometimes I do a full line art recolor so it's not just pure black. But with this, because there's so many shades, I actually think that having it be black keeps a level of contrast for the outlined areas that I want it to keep. But the areas that I do color the line art of is anywhere where there's like a lot of overlap of a similar color or texture. So for example, the character's toes 
are really close together, so they're gonna get their line arts colored because they're basically like a merged entity. There is separation between the toes, obviously, but like they're so close together that like you want to see them as all one unanimous object that makes up the foot. It helps things look more harmonious. Like it helps them look like actually attached to each other. And the other thing is it kind of gives the illusion of like flesh, which sounds gross, but walk with me. Because like when we were talking about subsurface scattering, there's no like perfect harsh shadow. You could think of line art as the same way. If line art is in a way a shadow or an outline for something, you have to stop thinking of it as being purely black or like a purely dark color because it's encapsulating things like skin and fur and other warm like warm blooded segments of the body and that should really be it for the critter.